All right, we're ready. You can go ahead, carry on. So I think the answer to your question has two parts. I think the reason why menopause is exploding now is partially because women um, of the age group that are hitting perimenopause and menopause are more willing to talk about the fact that they're getting older. They're not really wanting to hide it as much anymore. Um, all of us who are growing, letting our silver hair go, I think is, you know, a very, you know, superficial, but I think sometimes a really deeply kind of like psychological, um, you know, journey that women go through, you know, as part of their acceptance of that they're aging. And when you have women who've had hysterectomies or, you know, one after the other IUDs or, or have chosen not to have children, then I think that those are also a group of women who are, um, who see their self-worth in a different way. And so when they're coming up to menopause and now they have these symptoms about, um, about their reproductive sort of phases changing, that are really impacting on their own quality of life, their ability to do their work, things that have been really important to them. Um, they're looking for medical solutions and they're realizing that accepting that they're going through menopause is part of it. And so they're really, they're you know wanting answers that are pro-age, that aren't anti-aging, but that are like honest and open, right? And I think on the flip side of that, the medical community had to come around to realizing that that interpretation of the WHI in 2002 was exaggerated and for the most part, inaccurate when you're looking at women who are going through menopause acutely, right? The WHI was a prevention study where they intentionally enrolled women, enrolled women in their 60s and even 70s, who for the most part were not having symptoms, right? Because if you randomize people to hormone therapy or not who are having symptoms, you're going to have everybody dropping out who's on a placebo, right? So that study was actually designed to try to bring in women who were at higher risk of cardiovascular disease to look at their long-term health outcomes if they were put onto hormone therapy, whether they were having symptoms or not. And so, um, you know, that study should have never caused the pandemonium that it did. And so it, it took so many years of, you know, finally the long-term results of that and for other studies to come out, you know, to start walking that back and looking at it again. And as a gynecologist, I actually have had these moments of, of going, how, how is it possible? I went through, you know, a, an evidence-based residency program. And I remember reviewing the WHI. And what do you think will happen now with going forward? So exam. what I still and hear from like so many people is there's, was they're learning from the difference in breast cancer doctors on TikTok and, you know, or influencers on TikTok, whatever. They're, they're learning that the um, Women's Health Initiative was inaccurately portrayed. Now we're knowing what the true evidence is. But there are so many medical professionals, not even just medical, but many care providers who are not yet informed haven't women, done, uh, haven't read the up-to-date research and they are denying access to and, hormone therapy. And so I look at that as, um, I'm not a medical doctor, um, but has, I, has really I have always heard the term, first do no and harm. Now, and I think, arguably the loudest one is it doing there, harm by denying health. access to hormone therapy for many people? So what do you suggest people, until the medical community catches up, until training until it's, you know, that's yeah. some, that's part of the training for, for doctors going forward. But for people in this moment, working with a medical practitioner, what do you recommend they do so they can get access if they are facing that resistance? I 
I, I think it's really important for us to sort of embrace this reality now that medicine is should no is no longer a hierarchy, right? We really are trying to have shared decision making with our clients. You know, people are more educated now than they were before. Now, granted, you know, the general public health education overall, you know, sucks. <laughs> and so, of course, you know, women and what they understand about their body has been also um, not well addressed in our general population, whether you're looking at high school or you're looking at, you know, university or where you, whether you're looking at just the quality of resources that have been for women to help them learn about their continued, you know, women's health as they're going through their decades, right? So that's been a problem, but women are, are you know, intelligent and hungry and want to learn that. And so I think you now have a situation where a lot of women know more about their menopause than, than their doctor does, right? And so there are going to be doctors who are defensive about that. And that's why I'm always encouraging women to realize, look, this is kind of a team effort right now, right? This is actually a situation where you need to be able to go in with good resources from societies that have banners across them, right? You know, that come from menopause societies and, you know, the menopause guidelines come in and realize that this is potentially a, a teaching moment as well for your doctor. Give them the benefit of the doubt, come in well prepared um, and then go from there, right? Because, you know, I think um, I, I do believe that the number of family doctors who just back up and say, I don't know anything about menopause. That's not my thing. That is that is drastically declining. We're, you know, it's going to take a while for us to you know address that with all family doctors, but um, and I think a lot of them now are moving into the gray zone of saying, okay, so I realize this is a thing and that you truly are suffering, and I want to help you, but I don't know how at all. And so then that is meaning then that the referrals to menopause specialists and menopause clinics and anyone who will provide any sort of menopause care, and that includes nurse practitioner clinics, you know any. All of it now is just getting flooded with people who are going there and being referred there looking for their answers, right? So I do think that it, it will hopefully rapidly change in the next number of years that, um, you know, it's not difficult to to read, you know, the Canadian Menopause Society guideline about menopausal care. It's one guideline. Um, you can read the summaries. Um, there are, you know, weekend courses. You can access things like the North American Menopause Society meeting this last year that was in Philadelphia. The whole thing. You can you can you know pay a couple hundred bucks for it and and view it and get NAMS get CME credits for that right so the educational opportunities are out there and I think the more women are coming in and asking asking me asking and pushing the, I, the more I have other questions though, but I feel like we'll go, that will be a whole other podcast to episode to but I'm gonna stick I'm gonna Maybe stay here and, and, and let's when I see Right? So, so I, I think it's, I, think I know <laughs> it's, it, it has to be coming. The, you know, the overriding conversation really, uh, I want to talk about go, menopause oh, and GSM, but useless. you've um, mentioned the term perimenopause, been, menopause. Um, so from a definition by, perspective you know, for people who don't yet know the definition, what is perimenopause, what is menopause, is postmenopause an accurate term? No doubt that is extremely frustrating and that that undermines people's belief in that the medical system is actually looking out for them and can help them, right? So it's, it's, it's such a tangled up mess right now, but I do believe that there's an, an optimistic way out of it. <laughs> well, we can always do too, Kim. <laughs> Average menopause happens to women somewhere around 51, 52. That number wiggles around a little bit depending on your ethnicity, where you live in the world. There's some interesting things like, hey, living in higher elevations might lead to you having menopause a shred earlier. And of course, you know, different things in your life, you know, smokers, you know, if you've had chronic medical conditions, you know, there are lots of things that will potentially be associated with your menopause being a little bit earlier. And that's why we say that the, the average or the normal is for your final menstrual period to happen between 45 and 55. Well, a lot of people just kind of, a, a lot of women in our age group have just thought that women, you know, menopause happens when you're old somehow and not really thought about the process of how you get there. And that's when then you get into the categories of, well, what is early menopause? If your final menstrual period comes between 40 and 45. That's where we truly consider it early. So I do have women being referred to me who are having their final menstrual period at 47 and their family doctor is like honestly saying, you know, premature ovarian insufficiency. They're using, still using an old term like that. And it's like, no, no, no. 
Premature ovarian insufficiency is when you have your final menstrual cycle before the age of 40. Right? And surgical menopause fits into that too, right? So anytime you've had your ovaries removed, or maybe they've been damaged by like chemotherapy, or if you just spontaneously, you know, don't have enough eggs to have men menstruations up until that average age, anything that happens underneath the age of 40 falls into that umbrella of like premature or early, you know, too early, right? And so then that's POI and that surgical menopause and all those medically induced menopauses. Postmenopause is everything after, like, you know, menopause as a defined term is, again, it's, it's almost starting to become a bit archaic because in order to have the classic definition of menopause, 12 months with no menstrual cycle, well, you need to have a uterus that can show you it's having a menstrual cycle. So any woman who's had a hysterectomy, any woman who um, has a progestin IUD, had an endometrial ablation, or is on a continuous birth control pill, you can't use that definition. That's getting to be a big proportion of the population, right? But left to your own devices, the classic um, you know, definition of 12 months with no menstrual cycle is a sign that your brain has been using follicle-stimulating hormone and all of its willpower, all of its tools that it has to tell your ovaries to ovulate, and for 12 months, nothing has been able to happen. So it's a clinical diagnosis that at that point, it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess if your brain's been trying this hard for the last 12 months and you haven't been able to have a period, you're in menopause. Boom. Everything after that is now postmenopause, right? But sometimes people think about the symptoms as being their menopause and their perimenopause, right? So perimenopause is all of it around that. So as soon as you start having um, less um, uh, feedback loop of, of your ovaries talking to your brain, and so now all of a sudden you're not necessarily dropping menstrual cycles, but they're getting more intense, your PMS is getting worse, you're getting worse breast tenderness, you're getting more ups and downs in your mood. You can't track it well on blood work because it's a moving target. It's up and down and all over the place. But when, as soon as people start noticing those symptoms, and that can be in your late 30s, again, if you're on average menopause time zone, time frame of your final menstrual period coming sometime after 45, well, those symptoms of your eggs reducing in quality and quantity can start happening in your 30s. They can present as heavier periods. Um, of course, when people are trying to get pregnant, it can present as infertility and difficulty getting pregnant. Um, of course, it can then eventually start showing up as dropping your periods entirely. And it goes all the way through. Perimenopause starts with then and goes all the way through to when you can say menopause is, is has been declared, right? So again, even that perimenopause definition is not really an easy one for a lot of people. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's where a lot of the frustration has happened is that because of um, misinterpretation, again, of the WHI and a feeling that menopausal hormone therapy um, is a risk. And then also just the the starting up complications of hormone therapy. It's not uncommon to have some spotting, some breast tenderness, et cetera. And so, you know, if you wait until people have reached that menopause diagnosis, well, then you're pretty certain that their menstrual cycles are done. And so if they have any bleeding after that point, you know, whether on hormone therapy or not, you investigate it differently. But that has become, again, I think, you know, misinterpreted as nobody gets hormone therapy until they've hit 12 months of no period and menopause diagnosis. Again, that's just because we haven't been doing it. It's not because it's written in stone anywhere. So more people are needing access to um, symptom management options, whether it's hormone therapy or others, way before they hit that final menstrual period diagnosis. Yeah. And postmenopause. Yeah, that was super comprehensive. And, and a couple of things decades. that came up for yes, me was, and, you know, many people think third, that if they have if not a hysterectomy where just the uterus so has been removed and the ovaries are, are spared, some people still use the term surgical menopause. So yes, you are not bleeding, but technically you still have ovaries. But as I understand it, most people who have still have their ovaries but do not have a uterus will reach their really natural menopause and it earlier. Is that accurate? That those things are important, right? So, so now this ends up being you know, a really wide swath of women if you're talking about early or premature or POI, perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause. So that's, that includes women from somewhere around mid-30s for the rest of their life. Yes. 
possibly. Like if you if you have your uterus removed um, and your ovaries are left, ovaries get a small amount of blood flow from the uterus coming out, but a lot of their blood flow actually comes from the abdominal walls to the ovaries. So for if it's an uncomplicated hysterectomy and the blood flow, you know, to your ovaries is quite healthy from the side walls, then, you know, we have every reason to think that your menopause will be at the similar age as it would have been if you hadn't had your uterus removed. If you take it down to one ovary, so like one ovary maybe has cysts on it or something it needs to go, is scarred, and you're left with one. Probably then, you know, that has you a little bit earlier, like maybe by a year or so. But you're exactly right in that, you know, women, as soon as their bleeding is gone, if they haven't had horrible PMS to track and still go, whoa, I still can tell that's going on in the background. If they are, if they aren't women who are struggling with fibrocystic, you know, breasts that are flaring every single month and horrible mood that their life is just crashing in on them, there a lot of women just kind of then are free of the horrendous bleeding and just cruise on yeah. into the rest of their life. And it's not. Until I want to. I want to kind of shelve the. You don't have a bleeding pattern. The uterus that they start to and go, ovary conversation yeah, like from, my mood from and a menopause sleep, hormone therapy and it perspective, takes a long but time for people to put the pieces I'm going to come go, back to my 40s. the what comment you made about many, many. Current and medical so providers will often say you can't now, start your knowledge, menopause hormone you know, therapy until you so have reached that 12 consecutive months. So let's really let's let's have the population here enough. that hasn't had a hysterectomy. Um, haven't taught it well um, they they um, I have ovaries, have uterus. We're waiting for that final bleed, but there can be benefit to starting much earlier in some cases as it pertains to the symptoms that people are experiencing. So it's it's progesterone being the one that is usually the one that we intervene with first. So can you tell us somebody coming in, let's say they're 42 and they're experiencing some irregularities and might be experiencing some mood swings or, you know, some of the kind of earlier symptoms, what would your approach be? And as a tag along, and maybe if you can kind of weave it into your conversation, the difference between bioidentical versus non-bioidentical and right. where you sit with that recommendation. Right. Yeah. So perimenopause is truly different for everybody. So there isn't one size fits all. And I know that the hormone conversation out there is loud. But when you are a menopause practitioner, it's not difficult for any menopause specialist to be able to list off multiple people that you've tried hormone therapy on in perimenopause and it hasn't helped, right? So yes, when you're going through perimenopause, and actually there's a visual that you'll eventually use with this, right? I've got a, a graph here that I use when I try to explain this to clients. I made this for a presentation that I do um, for family doctors now all the time. When you are in your pre-menopausal area of your life, you know, your up and down of your estrogen and your progesterone is happening every month. Now that in itself for some people is no big deal and for other people is misery, right? PMS, PMDD, endometriosis, you know, horrible bleeding, all these things go up and down and fluctuate if your periods are left to their own devices, right? So when people start coming in with the earliest stages of perimenopause, they're not dropping a period yet. That's what these stars are. Their brain is actually trying harder to get their follicles to respond. And so sometimes you might have more of these little follicles making estrogen, but none of them, they're all sitting on the bench there, they're all warmed up for the game, but none of them feels like getting off the bench and going up to bat, right? And that's when you start actually then like losing that progesterone component of your up and down menstrual cycle. And so yes, it can be that in here, when you're um, making th thicker, heavier lining, but you're not bleeding it off, you're not making progesterone, you're not ovulating as well, it can be that cyclic progesterone in here can help a little bit to bring back sort of a predictable bleed so that you're not missing one entirely and now having a horrendous flooding period two months later, right? But for some people, again, that progesterone, they can be very sensitive to. Remember, progesterone is not made in your follicular phase at the beginning of, you know, your, of your month. For two weeks, you're making estrogen, and many people feel pretty darn good in their follicular phase when they're making nothing but estrogen. 
PMS and, and such comes in your luteal phase when you are making progesterone. So some people have been exquisitely sensitive to progesterone from the beginning, right? And so if you give people who are very progesterone sensitive more progesterone, they often don't necessarily feel better. They, I've had people come back and say that they felt suicidal, like on micronized bioidentical progesterone, and we'll get to that. So it doesn't always work for everybody, but it can be that, say, putting a progestin IUD in will help to reduce the bleeding and such. It can be that even though the antidepressants that we talk about, the SSRIs and the SNRIs, they've been kind of thrown under the bus because when doctors have been afraid to do hormone therapy, they've just gone to those. And they are second line, right? Hormone therapy for people who don't have contraindications is the gold standard and is first line. But that doesn't mean we don't have evidence that the SSRIs and the SNRIs can help. They can. There's a list of them that can help pretty much equivalent to some of the lowest doses of menopausal hormone therapy. And for some people where their hormones are already up and down, adding more hormones to the situation, for some people doesn't make them feel better. For some it does, right? And so it ends up being that perimenopause, you really have to kind of, you know, yeah. kind of troubleshoot a little bit more, figure out what people's main problem is, be willing to try something and then try something else. And what I always say to people in perimenopause is say, look, we can make the best plan today but six months from now, you're going to be moved further along in your perimenopause. It might not work. It might work great for three months. And then uh, the next three months, it won't because now you've moved into a different phase, right? And so, you know, that being willing to sort of like change it up and not see it as, you know, either you as, as the client, you know, something's wrong with you, something's, you know, we don't got this balance, right? There isn't just, you know, perfect, you know, resolution of all symptoms in perimenopause. And as a provider too, you have to be willing to kind of have that, you know, more rich conversation and say, we might have to change up the plan. It's not that I, that we chose the wrong thing. We had to choose something somewhere and then we change it up as we go, right? So for some people, perimenopause, um, particularly when they move along a little bit further and into here and they're actually dropping a period, then it can be helpful to use cyclic micronized progesterone because then that can mimic a luteal phase or a corpus luteum that you make whenever you ovulate. And that then when you take it for like about two weeks or so and then stop it, it mimics your corpus luteum making progesterone and then and then failing. Progesterone falls, that triggers then all of the pathways that then have your lining shed. So for some yeah. people, it can start with cyclic progesterone. Other people in their perimenopause, yeah. they start having vaginal dryness and hot flushes, but it comes and goes with their periods up and down. So again, if people don't have a contraindication, sometimes in perimenopause, it makes sense to put people on a birth control pill if they don't have a reason to avoid it especially if they've had it one in the past and they've realized you know, that they felt well on it. There are low dose pills. You know, there's one pill that actually does have a bioidentical estrogen in it. There are options that will calm the storm, so to speak, if your problem is your ups and downs of your hormones. And then they are the, you know, SSRI, the SNRI, sometimes people who've had chronic pain. Gabapentin can be helpful um, for people who have had fibromyalgia or, or different things. If you take it at night, it can help with your sleep and your hot flushes and your pain. You know, there's just a whole list of different things that we can go through one by one. But everyone is coming now wanting bioidenticals, right? Bioidenticals. So the term bioidentical really took off, I think, because the Women's Health Initiative used non-bioidentical therapy. Well, it's bioidentical to horses. It's actually a natural product, right? It is made by another mammal and it's collected, it's purified, etc. And that's how we have Premarin as an oral tablet for systemic hormone therapy. And Premarin has always also been available as a cream for genital urinary syndrome and menopause. So that was the most popular hormone therapy at, you know, in the 90s. And so that's the one that they studied that, or that's the one that you know, was in the Women's Health Initiative. That and um, a, pro a progestin called um, hydroxyprogesterone acetate, which again is also an oral um, uh, progestin. So that was the combo. And so when the WHI, again, was overblown in what it said the risks and, and the harms were to people by using even Premarin and MPA, um, that turned everybody away from those ones that are more traditional or they were at the time more traditional and had them then going over to people who were compounding and saying, well, you know, the problem was those nasty, you know, prescribed hormones. You should be on bioidentical. Bioidentical estrogen is estradiol. That's the uh, one that you make for the most part in your ovaries. It's made also in other areas of your body. You make estrogen in your fat, you make, you know, um, estriol um, from the uh, placenta. You know, there are different um, types of estrogens, but estradiol is the main one. So that became then really tempting for people to then say, well, I'll go over here then and I'll try compounding and bioidenticals because they're safe, they're natural, they're plant-based, they aren't going to harm me. Well, estradiol is just estradiol. It's actually also the active ingredient in pretty much every other menopausal hormone therapy except for Premarin. 
So every gel, every yeah. patch, every oral tablet of menopausal hormone therapy in Canada, there's only two exceptions to that, has estradiol in it, which is bioidentical. So bioidentical as attempting to yeah. just be a description of the chemical formula, you know, has been unfortunately a little bit kind of twisted around into women then thinking that it's like the natural and the safest and, and you have to get it in some sort of special formulation, you have to get it compounded. And compounding is actually where we don't want to see people go unless they really have to, right? Like if people have allergies, so what, you know, we like, shouldn't be shutting down the compound. When I pharmacies. think of, again, it, it, people get these knee-jerk when reactions. When I look at the research like, and, and back at bioidentical, yeah, the compounding. Women's Health Initiative and for formulations you know, and medications it, it, it that aren't was available. grossly doses, exaggerated. Right? And so compounding Yet there still, still was small increased there, risk of blood clots and cancers and that type of thing with the bioidentical, non-bioidentical um, hormone and therapy. You know, as in the physician community, we just call it menopausal hormone therapy. Um, but if it's estradiol in it, that's what it is. And if it's micronized progesterone that you yeah. take at bedtime, you know, technically that's what it is. Um, and that is prescribable yes. by all doctors, right? And so I think that has also become, or that has been a problem that has obstructed yes. women from getting hormone therapy as well because of that mystique and that misunderstanding around the term bioidentical. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's small. The truth is, we have to be honest that even the long term results of the WHI showed those numbers to be extremely small with the hormone therapy that now everyone wants to throw under the bus. And when people now like to talk about the long term results of the Women's Health Initiative, they keep on saying estrogen as if they're talking about bioidentical estradiol. It's like, the long-term results of the WHI that actually showed that it wasn't so so worth demonizing is still the Premarin and the MPA. So chill out, guys. Like, like menopausal hormone therapy, if it improves your symptoms, that's the benefit. That's why we should be offering hormone therapy. Whether it's bioidentical, I have clients who've been on Premarin for 30 years and they are fine. Um, and you try to, I've tried to switch them sometimes off to a transdermal and such, and they can't tolerate it, right? So there are people who benefit from non-bioidentical menopausal hormone therapy. So the, the, the take home message is that if you have symptoms, we should treat them. Okay? If you want to start with a bioidentical gel or a patch, well, that's fine because that's actually the majority of what we have available. But, but if you feel that an oral tablet is going to fit into your schedule better, you know, there's a risk, you know, there's a list of, of things that might make you a little bit a higher risk for clot. But again, people have overblown as well the risk associated with an oral estrogen in um, menopausal hormone Got it. therapy. Yeah, it's I, my, small, I was going right? to say, Most do you think that it will go like it's been indications to oral it's been, hormone therapy uh, either? But again, that kind of gets been more accepted. The term bioidentical is now more accepted. Now there's more people searching for it. Do you feel, based on what you said, there will be, I still think, a place for non-bioidentical and bioidentical. And people can make their choice and work collaboratively with their physician and see which one is going to work best for them. But to the, and, the overriding and it, it message is, is when there are menopause non-bioidentical has been demonized they never prescribe and anything unjustly or and don't and throw it right under the bus because that's just a sign that you have stay there as you, know, you, ha you haven't learned enough and you haven't met enough people because there are people who need to have their symptoms controlled and that bioidentical route doesn't work for them yep Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, because people who are on it are now like afraid. They're like, should I come off of it? You're 75. You've been on Premarin for 30 years. No one should tell you you have to come off of it. 
if you're doing well and you have osteoporosis and it's you know one of your indications to stay on it for your bone health no no one should tell you that you have to come off of it you know again unless you've accumulated a bunch of other risk factors right there are people who if i if you place them on bioidentical therapy they get all of their mood and their pms and their etc back again so there are people who yeah. would specifically should not be given bioidentical hormone therapy out of the gates they should be given some of these alternates um, you know, there's one yep. that's um, called Tibolone, which is um, neither estrogen or progesterone. It's a steroid precursor molecule that your body has the ability to, you know, do a bunch of chops here and there and modifications and you get an estrogen and a progesterone and a bit of an androgen effect from it, right? There's one that's called um, um, Duavive that has Premarin in it with Basodoxyphene. Basodoxyphene is a serum which means it's not going to have as much when it comes to spotting and breast stimulation and such, right? So there are benefits of these ones that are non-bioidentical by design. They are intentionally not bioidentical because they can have different advantages to them and they are the right thing for, for a good number of people. And as more people get access yeah. to hormone therapy, it's important that the, we have the conversation great around options that systemic, are non-bioidentical as well. Like the stats body, feel extremely um, well, right? I, don't I want to bring it. I want to bring it down you know, into the pelvis and into the vagina, but but a kind of a question that I want to I lead there is with the delivery. So you mentioned therapy, oral, you right? mentioned transdermal, so you mentioned the patch. So as we are opening that up and realizing that transdermal, it means it's, it's a, a delivery. People, the risks are small. The benefits it's a place of delivery. Basically. Then there are going to be more people. And transdermal estrogen usually means you put a patch on or you rub a cream or gel on your skin somewhere. They'll react to the glue in the patch. But local vaginal estrogen. Oral, the, you could you know, technically still say is that, transdermal on the outside, correct? The gel, and then maybe they got to try bioidentical. Like, we need to have all of them available to us. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yep. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes these terms, again, you know, they get mixed, they get confusing when they're so close, right? Um, so like local therapy or topical therapy, um, you know, is, is typically the terms that we try to use for the products that are intentionally designed to be placed on a skin surface and make their benefit on the skin surface where they make contact compared to systemic therapy, where yes, you are applying it, you know, you know topically, yes, you are applying a topical gel or a tap patch to your skin, but it's absorbing through your skin with the intent of getting a measurable blood serum level from your blood is where it makes it up to your brain, you know, for your hot flushes and night sweats, you know, to your bones, if that's one of your indications. And from your blood, some people will notice on their systemic hormone therapy that their genital urinary syndrome and menopause will improve because it's getting from your blood, you know, out to your tissues. That is not the same as a local therapy that you apply to the skin and you need to think about it more like sunscreen. You put sunscreen on your face, it doesn't protect your shoulders and it doesn't get into your bloodstream in, you know, in amounts, right? doesn't so that it can then give you sunscreen elsewhere it doesn't so a local product a cream or a tablet or a ring or any of these products that we do that are marketed and designed specifically for genital urinary syndrome menopause are specifically studied to be a dose and a formulation that is meant to stay local so sometimes when people start them when their their tissues are so thin and so dry and so fragile some people can notice that they have a little bit of change in their hot flushes or night sweats or breast tenderness or something that is a sign of how thin and fragile is there the ever a place for using the vagina the as the delivery as mode it, for through that all systemic. of a sudden if it, if it was at a higher dose they are side effects those are initiation side effects and they go away because your tissue becomes thicker and healthier and then it keeps it again local which is what its intention is and that's where then the data is very clear that the amount of systemic absorption that you get from um, local therapies over the course of an entire year is a fraction of a birth control pill, right? This is why local therapies are now being offered um, to people who are breast cancer survivors, right? Because they are designed, if you use them according to directions, they are designed to be so low dose that they are treating a skin surface. They are not a systemic therapy, so they don't impact then on all those other body systems.
also, yeah, exactly. And this is why the research is important, right? Because yeah, you can place micronized progesterone in your vagina instead of swallowing it, right? People who have problems um, with um, a lot of um, gastrointestinal upset from taking micronized progesterone, if they place it in their vagina, they can absorb it um, and then get the uterine benefit from that, but they often have less than of a sleepy side effect from it, right? So it's a different route of getting into your system. Um, yeah, like there are products like say the, the Nuva ring is, um, is a silicon ring that is a birth control pill method. Well, you place that medical grade silicon ring in your vagina, it has enough of the um, active ingredients that it will um, get into your bloodstream and provide you with trustworthy contraception because the dose is higher. Where if you're using the E-string, the E-string dose is designed to be lower and slower absorption. And so that is a local therapy, even though both of them are a medical grade silicone ring that you place in your vagina. So this is why this is why science and, and evidence-based and health Canada approval and everything is important because the doses and the and the um, the research and the and the absorption matters, right? Um, uh, so, and there is also actually to add even more confusion for people in the state, there is one that's called the femring, which is systemic, um, estrogen therapy that is in a silicon ring that is a high enough dose that it will absorb from your vagina. In Canada, we have only the E string. Okay. Right? We have only this one called the Kind of backtracking string, a little bit, but which, just for um, clarity, the dose, you know, to, and that's we've said Canada the term GSM, genitourinary syndrome. But yeah, you're exactly Can you please right, define right? that? Like I've had clients who... Um, misread the directions and are using an, you know, a, a huge amount of the creams on a daily basis. And so, yeah, they're treating their hot flushes and their night sweats inadvertently. Um, and they're not getting uterine protection. If you have a uterus and you are absorbing estrogen systemically, then you need to have something that will protect your lining. And so, um, if people have been inadvertently, because the directions that, get, that were given to them have been wrong sometimes, sometimes they've interpreted it wrong. Um, but you can get systemic um, estrogen levels um, from the vagina if you don't dose it right. Yes. So genital urinary syndrome of menopause is the new, better, and more appropriate term for what used to be called vaginal atrophy. Vaginal atrophy was very singular, right, in that you have an atrophy and a shrinking down of your vagina. What horrible messaging that is, right? And so um, when the medical community started listening to women and realizing that they actually are kind of emotionally triggered by someone telling them that their vagina has dried up and died, um, it was realized that it's probably more important to actually accurately describe what's going on. So genitourinary means your genital area and your bladder system. Syndrome, because it really impacts on your personal wellness, your relationships, your ability to function of menopause, because this is a low estrogen problem, right? So GSM is kind of, you know, the acronym for that now. And it's meant to encompass that there are signs. So things that doctors can see. So that might be that the skin is thinner, paler. If you are getting a speculum exam done, the doctor can see that there's less um, um, vaginal secretions, um, that the that the cervix looks like... Um, very smooth and fragile that it's got little blood yeah, vessels yeah. on the surface because it's so you know you bump it with the speculum and it wants to bleed the vaginal walls are flat and and you know and thin and pale those are signs and we can see yeah. them on the vulva too right the i have labia, been you know are thinner um you know that the clear based on wood and, and evidence from there are things many other practitioners but there are also providers symptoms. that i follow with research so symptoms knowing how many people are affected you know upwards of 80 percent it's not something that gets better so with time genital urinary syndrome of menopause you know, symptoms should now come back again if you stop using it so um, i and i recommend people around the start of their again, menopause had, sooner um, if they have symptoms letter from the doctor says ask what their provider for vaginal like, estrogen that they will yeah, stay the on for the rest of the maybe the dose might change the delivery method may change but it's it's a lifelong therapy do you agree with that so, um, so that's the bigger umbrella term now, GSM. I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a kind of an awkward, long, big term, but it is more accurate. Right. Hallelujah. Yes. Yep. yep. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Because again, there've been people who've been afraid. Um, they don't realize that their symptoms are part of their menopause. And of course there are people who, if they didn't have a whole lot of hot flushes and night sweats and they kind of made it through their menopause without accessing their doctor, they don't realize that years later, the problems that they're having with their bladder and their recurrent yeast infections and, and their discomfort and now their sexual pain, they're not linking that back to something that happened five, 10 years ago. So the, you know, women need to be better informed. Their partners need to be better informed. All doctors who are prescribing Viagra to males should be asking them if they are um, in a heterosexual relationship. And if so, you know, is their partner menopausal and to see, yeah. right? That needs to be part of it. You can't just treat one member of the, of the couple. Um, so all of the, and, and, and doctors need to initiate the conversation, right? Because again, you know, if we're realizing that a lot of other people yeah. out there in the general public aren't connecting the dots, yeah. we need to connect the dots and we need to offer it before it becomes a problem. Because otherwise, you know how it is, you see it in your clients, people suffer and they have horrible dryness and they try this and None they try that them. and they try over the counter things <laughs> and they try supplements and then they've got lubricants and moisturizers. Finally, sometimes they make it to public floor physio. Sometimes they just like grit their teeth and, yeah. and yeah. make it through painful intimacy until finally their relationship is just about on the brink. And now they're coming to their doctor yeah. saying they have a low libido. Well, we missed the train when it left the station a long time ago, right? We could avoid so many of those problems if we were not afraid to have the conversation. And so a couple of questions with regards to the differences when we know that between they systemically. So DH, like, what uh, women vaginal DHA be and, a local and um, when it's, when estrogen. It's a local and I also want to ask right? a question on the testosterone, um, but before I go there, people that I have the estrogen say, cream no, 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 in Canada is estragyne, uh, which is source, like, which really? is estrone. You really not have, correct? Da, 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 so because again, the estrone being the one that, that is primarily produced in fat later on in life. And then many people talk about it as being more inflammatory. So is Someone, there, they'll, they'll come like, up what's the reason for right? why fishing. don't we have a bioidentical that's, that's being vaginal estrogen cream that, that is estradiol in Canada? Do you think we ever would? And is, is this the one local still so equally as so effective for, for for people in your practice? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Well, we have vaginal products yeah. that are estradiol. It's just that the cream, this specific cream is the E strong, right? But if you're not going to be using that, then the Imvexi, you know, little capsules, these are estradiol. The Vagifem is estradiol. The E string is the estradiol. So, it, you know, it's a good question. You know, why did they choose to put E strong in the cream instead? Um, you know, it, these things come from other countries. There is an estriol um, um, government approved vaginal product in Australia. But again, estriol is the weakest of all of the estrogens and up from that is estrone and then up from that is estradiol, right? So again, sometimes when people yeah. have come to me and they've been on the estriol compounded vaginal creams, they're still having symptoms of GSM and it's because it, because it's, it's such a weak estrogen, it's less effective. So you do have to have good manufacturing and reliable dosing in order to know that the estriol products are going to help you, right? So, you know, I think, and in the last couple of years, man, like the products are just increasing. It used to be that it was, you know, the ring, which hardly anyone knew about. It was the Premarin cream and the Estragine cream and then Vagifem, these little Vagifem tablets that have been around, you know, for decades. Well, the Imvexi is new. That's been released this year. The DHEA that you alluded to, um, the DHEA is a little capsule that is on, um, that has like um, oils as part of its um, sort of inactive ingredients, but they're not inactive. Moisturizing is good for your vagina, right? Mm -hmm. So the benefit of doing the DHEA, which is a daily dose, where most of these other ones will get back off to a couple times a week. As a daily dose, you're getting your moisturizer in there and your DHEA. DHEA is being created by your adrenal glands on a daily basis. It's in your bloodstream. It can be measured. But um, it's not really impacting on your vaginal health. If you place DHEA directly into the vagina, it's called intrachrenology, yeah. where inside the cells of the vaginal walls, 
you have the enzymes to make that into both estrogen and androgen. The vulva is full of androgen receptors. So again, I'm not pulling all of my people who are doing very well on estrogen creams and tablets off and saying they must go on to this. Is but there I a place for somebody to use estrogen and DHEA? So on available, the twice a week, right? they're using their estrogen. The other days of the week, they would be using their DHEA. Particularly the different estrogen-only type of um, vaginal products and just maybe not kind of gotten all of the benefits that they should, then it makes sense to then try a different active ingredient, you know? Um, no different than bioidenticals, you know, go through your body. If you, the gel or the patch doesn't work, well, then maybe you should try one of the non-bioidenticals, right? So I mean, DHEA, again, uh, if you're going to use the term bioidentical, yeah. you know, then obviously DHEA should fit into that category. But it's not about the bioidentical ingredients that makes it safe. It's, it's, the, it's the approval process. It's the manufacturing. It's the reliability. It's the recalls if they need them. You know, that's what makes the product safe. Yeah. That hasn't been studied, as far as I know, um, because you know yeah. the products seem to be kind of like from a testosterone perspective. You mentioned that we have um, androgens, like it, it's part it was, of us, you know, it's, it's being part of the, the tissue support. The so and yeah, I don't so know of anyone just who would big be doing overriding one conversation. Or the other. No I do know how a few people, testosterone who, um, a few clients who replacement just therapies forget, for they just don't remember it's, it's to do it on a daily basis. That can be a reason why you know they might prefer a, a tablet or a cream or something that is intentionally meant to be you know two three times a week, yeah. or they might find that once they've gotten up to yeah. you know to improve tissue quality, maybe they can miss a dose here and there, and maybe only be taking it three four times a week, and they still have the benefit. Again, that's not published and that's not well studied, but you know that clinically that's what we um, what we're starting to see now that we've been able to prescribe this product for more often. Okay. Yeah. There, there is one that's called Androfem. It's been uh, manufactured in Australia. It is available in the UK and people can pay cash for it, but it hasn't come here to Canada yet. I hope that it will soon. Um, the benefit of um, a product like Androfem is that, you know, it is the smaller appropriate doses that people can use it on a daily basis. It isn't difficult for us to use the ones that are available. Like, for for um, for my clients who do need to be on testosterone, then I just simply prescribe for them, you know, the the pump of Androgel um, that is designed for male um, clients. But then they're just using, you know, one pump of it a couple times a week, right? Which if they're switching their patch a couple times a week or they're doing their, you know, vaginal cream a couple times a week, it's not a big deal, right? And usually that's a sufficient dose. Um, it's been rare that I've had clients who need to be using like multiple pumps or every single day, because you got to watch people's blood levels, right? Um, and if their blood levels start going high and super physiologic, we don't have any evidence to say that that's okay, right? Like that's, that's, then you're, you're potentially getting into like anabolic steroids, right? You know, yes, you can get anyone to build muscle and have, you know, an amazing libido with high enough levels of testosterone, but that's not the goal of when we're, you know, doing it for women. Um, and even the blood levels, right? Like we're testing blood levels to make sure that your levels on your own are low, not because that's a diagnosis, um, but because that tells us that your levels are low so that if you are having symptoms that should, you know, that could be benefited by a trial of testosterone therapy, then we know we have room to bump you up and still keep you in, you know, what we know to be women physiologic range. And there's all sorts of problems with it. You know, there are problems with testing testosterone levels on the bottom end of the spectrum, right? Where the test is, is designed really would to be you testing give somebody, There are problems if that- If you're with working with somebody who they would benefit from testosterone- What you measure in the bloodstream isn't necessarily would you, a, a, what, a straight correlate How would you deliver it? Would it be transdermal are taking on the it up, skin? Would it be right? topical this isn't an on the an vagina? A lot of people say you don't want to put Hormones it close to the clitoris because so the clitoris is going to get too large. And I'm sure that's also dose dependent. How quickly them up into the cells, that's where they're doing their activity. So even blood levels are just kind of um, like a, a blunt um, uh, indicator of whether or not you're absorbing and making sure that we're not, you know, out of what we think are relatively normal ranges. But that doesn't mean that everyone sees the benefit that they want to um, on testosterone therapy or even on estrogen therapy, right? Like hormones are really elegant and complex and, and we shouldn't try to simplify them. Uh, 
Um, you know, right now, again, we don't have any health counter approved products that are testosterone that you would apply to the vagina or the vulva. But the for people who do want to kind of experiment with that benefit, that's where the DHEA um, vaginally is, is a good option. I would um, prefer that for people rather than them getting to compounded testosterone. Um, because again, you don't know if you're, if you're, the dose is going to be something that over time is going to contribute to them having clitoromegaly or whether or not the formulation is getting absorbed into their bloodstream and then you are getting systemic, you know, absorption from it, right? So um, if people are going to be doing it systemically, there is an ishwish guideline about this. Um, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health they collaborated with the International Menopause Society, the IMS, and I think the AMS from Australia. So it's a it's a joint collaborative statement where they do say, look, like, first off, we need way more research in this area, right? But they have tried to go through the literature that there is. And, you know, the, and there are studies here and there, but the problem is that they're, they're, they're small or they're too short or they're yeah. in this particular population. And so, like, we just really need more of this research to be done so that we can, you know, be more clear as to who can benefit yeah. from it. Yeah. Um, but of people who Amazing. Um, um, don't have a contract. I'm trying to think if I have any other questions that I want before I know we've gone. Um, reason to think very deep and trial um, is, is <laughs> long time, that but they should pursue. I guess then the guidance is to do those baseline le- blood levels, make sure that there is room, wiggle yeah. room. I actually do have a question on that. Yeah. Fine. Thank you for, you know, for of course, highlighting there's often that. a psychosocial, so, you know, component. It when used it comes to be, and I shouldn't say it used to be. Don't just medicalize it and say everything's going to be There was often a a loading dose for vaginal estrogen once a day for two weeks and then twice a week thereafter. Before they've been able to finally get an opportunity. Other practitioners who I I follow have now said, actually, I don't do the loading dose because, especially somebody who's been in that low estrogen state for a really long time, too much too soon can sometimes create those, you know, yeast infection reactions that it goes systemic, it doesn't stay in act locally. So we just start out with uh, twice well, a week. So where do you fall on that? Again, it's good. I understand really it's individualized, but what's the general you know, consensus that there? Something that is just in a guide. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, for me, it depends on the context in which we're starting it up. Like if someone is already on systemic hormone therapy and they're finding that their GSM is still there, well, then they already have, have you know, estrogen going through their bloodstream. And so, you know, you're really not even if in with your loading dose initially, and even if the vagina is thin and fragile, their bloodstream and their breasts and everything have already come in contact again with estrogen. So less problems, it seems to be that way. But I also then often don't find that it's it's as necessary to do a loading dose in those situations because, again, they might have gotten some small benefit from the systemic. So sometimes then you can just go right into the products that are two or three times a week. Um, if people have had, um, if people are not on systemic hormone therapy, but they have a lot of concerns um, about this, then again, you want to minimize anything that's going to give them those breast effects because even if it is an initiation side effect and it's a very small window of time, because the fears about estrogen and breast cancer have been so intertwined as soon as people have a benign side effect of initiation of estrogen such as breast tenderness boom they're they're afraid and they're backing off right so so it's it's a matter of um sometimes i just even just have that as an open conversation with someone and say look we can start you off with a loading dose for you doing some of this every single day you might have some breast tenderness and some systemic feelings from that but the intention is that it will fast track improving the quality of the tissue in your vagina so that we're going to get to homeostasis a bit faster. But you don't have to do that. If that ends up giving you too many side effects, then you can back off, but it just might take us then a little bit longer to get up to then, yep. you know, um, true mechanism of action has been achieved that we now have your vagina and your vulva and everywhere, you know, healthier. And we can maintain that, right? So, you know, the principle was always, you know, meant to be altruistic, right? Of like, let's get people feeling better faster. But, um, you know, you just need to have a conversation then about, you know, which way is better. And of course, some right, some right, products right. like the ring, yeah. there is no loading dose, right? You place this in, it starts giving you constant secretion from day one. 
So if you pull this out every once in a while for intimacy and, and you pop it back yeah. in again and you miss a day, it's not a big deal. Like you've yeah. got rather steady state. You know, they might show that there is a little bit more of, of, a, of a blip in your blood serum levels when you first, you know, put in a fresh ring. But again, over the course of 365 days of the year, makes no, makes no difference. Totally. Um, yeah. I often find that the Vagifem tablets, as they are prescribed, one of these teeny, tiny, tiny 10 microgram tablets twice a week is is not enough for most people. So yeah. the, the number of times I have people refer to me saying that they've tried vaginal estrogens and it didn't help. Yeah. Well, they were typically prescribed Vagifem twice a week and we're forgetting the dose half of the time. So, so again, you got to think about, you know, whether or not people are really yeah. dosing things yeah. right. Because again, sometimes people... If you don't address concerns um, about breast hang cancer, on one second. I just heard my doorbell go. I just want to go, but I want to, I want to kind of wrap it up with one more question. So if you can just hang on for one sec, I apologize. Do with less. A and that's a, again, that's a sign that we've then missed an opportunity to educate people to say, if you underdose and you haven't fixed the problem, then there's no point. You know, the point, the point is to get people feeling better, whether it's with your systemic hormone therapy or with your local therapy. So if you haven't gotten to the point of your, of your symptoms going away, then we're not there, right? And, and there isn't risk. There isn't risk to using the type, the dose that will improve your symptoms. If anything, you know, if you're underdosing it, so then whenever you are trying to use a little tablet, then you are getting breast tenderness, you know, then you're never getting this, the tissue down there healthy again. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sir. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, one final question before we wrap up is what you just said with regards to the ring, taking it out for sexual activity. So many people also, you know, do we need to protect our partners from it? Should we make sure that all sexual activity has happened? And you're saying we do need to remove the E string for sexual, for insertion, correct or no? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no problem. My doorbell, your doorbell. <laughs> okay, so what's left? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, some people do, some people don't, right? So again, if you think about the fact that the vagina is not a rigid tube that is exactly the size of your partner or, you know, your sex toy or whatever, right? Like the vagina is, is, uh, is a roomy area that is not just a tube, right? And so some people do have their E string in there and they completely forget that it's in there. And they have, it, it, maybe they thought they were going to take it out for intimacy, but then they forget and they do. And then they're like, oh, that was... That was okay. Other people do. Um, some people, right. of course, have a pestery. So they have a pestery and they have their E string right behind it um, in order to, you know, give them that, um, that estrogen that to reduce their chance of getting erosions from their pestery. Um, and so, you know, those people don't tend to take it out, right? Because those t people tend to come into their doctor and have it rinsed and washed and with other pestery and then have a new E string placed. But for your average, you know, person who um, is sexually active, some people will remove it. Some people will not. It's really just based on your comfort level, but it doesn't have to be. And the other products, um, again, you know, sometimes that interferes with people's, you know, spontaneity. So, um, you know, creams and such um, tend to be dosed at bedtime so that then they're, you know, just kind of like, you know, hanging around in the area and not just falling out into the toilet if you're doing them first thing in the morning, right? So most people tend to place their um, creams and their tablets at nighttime. Yeah. But what I like to say to women is, you know what? Most women should not be surprised when intimacy comes a knocking, right? Most yeah. women <laughs> in most relationships should be able to tell that there's been some flirtation, there's been some suggestion, that they're planning for it. Too often, I see that there are many, many women who are still stuck in a, um, a rote pattern with their partner of, 
doing their daily business, getting the job done, you know, paying the bills, clean up the house, blah, blah, blah. And they finally hit the pillow. And then it's like, pink, pink, pink. How about now? That, that is not foreplay. That does not appreciate that many, many people have a responsive libido, which is completely normal, but it does require a little bit of brain engagement before the actual activity, right? Yeah. So most women yeah. should not be, and just, you know, over, final over, over note, again, inconvenienced by the DHA the product, is not your now, lubricant. We still benefit from lubricant. Want, right? It's also so, not your moisturizer. Um, so that, we still that benefit I, you know, from moisturizer. To to They're all casual yeah. conversation with women to maybe also try to empower them to, to move that area of their relationship a little bit if, if they'd like to. And then there are other tests, you know, so for example, I asked the, the people specifically who make Intra Rosa, the DHEA product, and they said, you know, within an hour, the active ingredient has been absorbed. Yeah. And not only that, but there aren't the um, enzymes um, in the in the uh, skin of the penis that are going to be um, converting and, and it wouldn't make any difference anyways. It's such a small dose. So, so for the most part, the vaginal products don't have a concern to um, a partner. Yeah, which is... Yeah. Reading my mind. Yes. Yes, that's exactly what the, where my brain was going next. Because right. again, so often I ask people what they're doing for their lubricant and they will tell me pre replens. Right. So, so many people are, again, stuck in products that have been around for forever and not reading the labels and not realizing that moisturizers are like skin moisturizers. They are meant to absorb into your skin and disappear. Yeah. They are hyaluronic acid, they are vitamin E, they're meant to leave the skin surface and get into your, your deeper layers of your tissue. So that's good on a day-to-day yeah. -day basis, but no, when you're having intimacy, mm -hmm. um, you need to have something that's a lubricant. And having a well-estrogenized and healthy vagina, so you don't have dysuria mm -hmm. and infections and such, may or may not lead to better lubrication, right? Some people have used the lube since they were in their 20s. They just don't have the same kind of glandular secretory function um, with arousal. Yeah. That doesn't mean that they're not interested and they're yeah. not turned on. It's just that we're all slightly different that way. And so, again, I try to coach people and say, look, there's because so many women are so hesitant, you know, they, they worry that it's breaking the spontaneity or that their partner doesn't like it. And it's like, well, again, if your partner understood what painful sex actually feels like, then maybe this wouldn't be a problem. And yeah, this might be a skill that you have to then figure out how you're going to weave this in a little bit or use the lube applicators. Again, if you can tell that intimacy is coming, well, then use one of those like lube applicators that you can just load up and you and you place the lube high up just like you would with a vaginal cream or etc. And then it and then it can kind of lubricate and coat the inside walls of your vagina if you feel self-conscious about placing it on your vulva or on your partner, right? Like there are ways to work around this stuff so that, you know, something as, as beneficial and as effective as lubricant is something that people um, can really benefit from. And again, people yeah. are buying still flavored ones, tingling ones, yeah. you know, things that have yeah. all sorts of extra ingredients in them. I tell people like this is about osmolality, the estrogen, and again, that's a chemical. Like a lot of people say, the the, the predominant, but if you like, have the a, most a receptors are in that first two thirds of the vagina, so it, place it there. It but a, a should we should we plunge it all the way up? Should it be you know fluid from just other in the first third, areas or it's a what's your recommendation there? So high osmolality lubricants can actually dry out your skin a little bit. Um, as well, um, the pH is important. So moisturizers and lubricants shouldn't have a basic pH if in menopause we're doing everything we can to try to keep your pH in your vagina a little bit more acidic and lower. So, you know, that ends up being the reason why then I recommend certain lubes over others is because that osmolality and pH um, are really important yeah. factors. And you can get around that entirely with something that's like silicon, right? Because silicon is neither. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I think sometimes that can be reflected on what people's symptoms are. So if people have a um, don't complain that they have vulvar discomfort, but they do have into, um, yeah. dryness with intimacy, then I will lean them towards a product like a cream or a tablet that they do place high in their vagina. And, and I don't try to tell them to kind of keep it to the lower part because, you know, again, if you place a tablet or a cream high up in the vagina, it's it's going to it's going to coat the walls and come down. Um, but if people. Um, um, aren't describing that that's a problem or they, you know, got lube, but their vulva is really what's uncomfortable, yeah. then yeah. I'll encourage them instead to use a cream or the DHEA ovule that will liquefy and be able to cover more surface area. And sometimes there are people that were kind of walking the line between both. 
people who have used, you know, their teeny tiny tablet for years, and that's fine. But now they actually do have pain and discomfort on their labia around mm -hmm. their clitoral area, because that teeny tiny tablet that is placed six inches up your vagina right. is not getting to the skin surface on the vulva. And right. so I do have some people who this has been so informative. Thank you so much. And, you are and, and an incredible wealth of, of knowledge. They like it. It's worked this for them for years. Like a four hour but then we will podcast, place a little but... tiny bit of. <laughs> Thank you so much. Where can people find you and learn more areas, about right? all the amazing so, things? So, you know, again, you there, there is room for us to, to customize um, how we do this. Um, yeah. But again, sometimes, again, with this DHEA one, I found that if um, people don't have to use the applicator, and so if they use their finger, they can push it up, up as far as it can go. Because sometimes if they use the applicator and whether, whether or not they push the plunger right, you know, the question is whether or not the tablet gets, you know, dragged out again, right? Where if, if you're just kind of pushing it with your finger, you can make sure that it, it gets set kind of up there nice and high. And then it's less likely to just then kind of fall out and get lost. Yeah, well, it's, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, so I still am on my Instagram, but not as often as I'd like to be. Uh, my practice is very busy. I do practice in Ontario. Um, and so I am available for people when it comes to um, wow. uh, telemedicine referrals. So clients being referred to me for a one-on-one -on -one conversation about this. But that as well has become very busy lately. So I'm offering a lot of um, what's called e-consults. So there is a, a telemedicine platform across the province <laughs> where physicians yeah. can reach out to other physicians um, particularly specialists and, you know, upload the history and et cetera of their client and in the yeah. secure platform, yeah. ask questions. And when I sign up for that service, That's awesome. I try to get to those um, within seven days. So it's a year to wait uh, to see me in person, but it's seven days. If your really cool. nurse practitioner, gynecologist, family doctor is willing to, you know, partner with me and realize that this is a learning um, skill set for them. So it's more like coaching for me to be no. able to kind of get them, you know, yeah. and, yeah. and I'm Amazing. expositor. I'll have all the links like, to everything in the if, show notes. If they don't want to thank get you for taking your time away. You're a very busy woman and you uh, shared so graciously you know, PDFs your information. And, and I'm really grateful for that. And thank this is the so guideline. Much. Like I juice it up because I want them to <laughs> see that thank as an you. educational opportunity, not only so that they have confidence now with the client that they've asked me about, but maybe also with other people, right? So I really do try to use the e-consult tool as a teaching tool. And I probably see now just as I help just as many new patients on the e-consult service as I do in my day-to-day -day practice, right? Um, but yeah, I, I do need to get onto my Instagram more or, or some sort of, you know, um, web-based educational online platform because, you know, the, the needs aren't going away anytime soon, right? We just need to keep on getting good resources out there. Oh, well, I've been looking forward to this for a long time, Kim. I'm glad we could finally connect.